today. Um, we have one of our uh, one of our favorites, a homegrown product here with us today. Um, before I introduce him, let me give our uh, CME caller. We're going to do Cardinal in honor of uh, Stanford and, uh, and Steve. And those of you who don't know, Cardinal is actually a color. It is not because of the bird um, or the uh, Stanford Cardinal. So um, really excited to have Dr. Frick here with us today. Um, so his legacy here at CMC for all of you residents who uh, sort of know the name and in history of, uh, of our program, it's really important. You know, Steve started here in 1991 uh, as a resident and then came back after his fellowship at uh, Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego 
was program director here from 2000 to 2012. Um, really, uh, I would give him full credit um, under Dr. Hanley's uh, leadership of really building this place to what it is now. And uh, we're all very indebted to Steve. Um, you know, one of the best uh, educators and teachers that I've ever had the uh, privilege of learning from. So really excited to uh, have an opportunity for that today. You know, since leaving here, he's uh, continued his, his leadership path. Uh, he helped build and start the uh, Children's Hospital in Orlando, the Nemours Hospital there, was chair there, then moved on to Stanford where he's vice chair of education and uh, chief of pediatric uh, orthopedics there. Um, has been uh, is a recent uh, president of uh, Pediatric uh, Orthopedic Society of North America. So really has done as much to, you know, secure the legacy of our program and uh, the roots that he built here as anyone, you know, for Nani, he was the very first research fellow um, here at CMC. He started the uh, research fellowship. So has really done quite a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that one of the things that, uh, that we were talking about is, um, and, and I do, you guys know, I built the uh, grand round schedule for the year and we always love having alumni come back and it's fun to, you know, see what they've done since they left here. And, you know, as I thought about alumni and talked to Dr. Scannell and Dr. Mormon about it, there is no alumna, alumnus who better represents and has represented us better than Steve Frick. So um, what we uh, have done is we are actually naming our uh, visiting professor award for alumni in his honor, the Stephen Frick Distinguished Alumni Visiting Professor Award. So every uh, alumnus who comes to visit us will get a plaque with uh, Steve's name on it. And uh, I think that all those gathered in the room would uh, agree with me. There's no more, uh, no person better fitting this honor than Steve. So Steve. Anybody who was here as a resident or a, or a faculty from 91 to 2012, come on up and let's get a picture with Steve. <laughs> <laughs> seats in front. Get volunteers. Oh, look at that. Four people just coming right up. Thanks. All right. So do you, do you guys don't mind sit uh, two, to, two to five so that I know who to call on? Who on the left? Uh, all right, so we're going to uh, do a little bit of a uh, flipped classroom. Um, I'm not going to do much lecturing, so to speak. I'm going to ask a lot of questions and hopefully you all um, know a good bit about pediatric supine and humerus fractures. And so we're going to do a little self-assessment uh, to start. But, uh, you know, in 2013, I got involved in the Milestones Project, and we picked supine humerus fracture as sort of a, a key area of knowledge that residents should learn in the pediatric realm. 
And this is just some of that data that we were tracking. It's kind of changed a good bit now, but uh, when we first started, this was the patient care. And so you could see interns level one, you know, sort of up to um, fifth years and uh, appropriate increase in knowledge. So if one is a novice and five is an expert and four is a competent, you know, graduating resident, just tell me where you think you are now, one to five. What's your self-assessment of your two? All right. Three. Three. Yeah. Four. All right. No one wants to be an expert yet. All right. So, uh, I've been teaching residents how to take care of super collars for a long time, about 25 years. And uh, it's been fun. It's one of my most fun uh, things, I think, to do with the residents. Uh, enjoy taking call. And I think there's a lot of principles about fracture care that you can learn from taking care of children's elbow fractures. And there's a lot of just surgical decision making. There's a lot of complexity to some of these injuries, which we'll talk about today. And so I, I, you know, having come from CMC, where the mantra was always do the right thing, I always said we're going to do it the right way. And of course, if you're in my OR, the right way is my way. Um, but there's lots of different ways to take care of supraglial humerus fractures if you're a principle-based thinker. Um, so this is Sahi Denulari, who was a hand fellow here last year. And I think Sahi took it to a little bit of an extreme. So he sent me a photo. He's like, I'm going to show him in Charlotte how to do it the right way. So uh, <laughs> here he is showing Dr. Waters. He pulled out my... Uh, 20 steps to success for close reduction and pending of superpellant humerus fractures. And I have them and I, I quickly texted back. I said, Sahi, that guy you're with, he doesn't need any help. <laughs> just listen and just do what he says. You're in his room today, not my room. So uh, anyway, uh, we're going to get started. So um, it's Andrew, right? So Andrew, uh, when I was your year, uh, this came in from the mountains of North Carolina, transferred to me, pulseless white hand. Um, and uh, so number one, what does pulseless white hand make you think? What's going to happen? If it really is pulseless and it really is a white hand, what's going to happen to that kid? And speak loud because there's people out there and dysvascular limbs so we're about compartment syndrome. And compartment syndrome, that might be a good thought. Dysvascular. So um, kid shows up exactly like this. Okay. So I learned a lot of lessons from this case. So he's in the ER. They have this x-ray. His arm is just like this. What are you going to do? Extend his arm. Extend his arm, right? So what do you think happened when we extended his arm? Pulse came back, right? And he got pink and it was fine, right? So this is how we used to treat supercolor humerus fractures because uh, the reduction is hyperflexion. And then we would wrap him up in a cast like this, right? So what's wrong with that? The perfusion really poor it can cause poor perfusion because where is the perfusion? Where's what what artery is supplying the hand? Great gun. Where is it in the elbow? Anterior within the front, right? So as you flex it, you're gonna cut off the pulse, right? So that leads to the next question. We'll go up the chain. So why do we pen supercolor humor fractures? Two reasons. This is like trauma conference, right? When they ask you why. So the three most important words for an orthopedic resident to learn during residency, especially trauma conference, are what? Rotation. Length, rotation. And yeah, those things. But the three most important words for any topic, if somebody asks you a question. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Do not be afraid to say, I don't know. If you don't know, you can say, I don't know. But give me your best guess. Two guesses. Two reasons we pension for calling your Two reasons. The hold the reduction. And right. to prevent the uh, open contracture or ischemia in a hyperflex gas. Yeah, so what, what can you do once you pen it? You can have it more extended. Exactly. Right. So two reasons to pen it. Obtain and maintain a fracture in an acceptable position until healing. So because what was the number one complication of this treatment? You know, we'll go up the lane. Okay. What's the number one? If we treat it like this, what's the number? What's the most common complication? It's not both. Bowman's is the most dreaded complication. Yeah, if we treat it like this, we just put it in a cast and say, what's gonna what's the most common complication? Malunion. What kind of malunion? Extension, a little bit. What do we call it? The most common malunion and what's it called? Cubitus varus. Cubitus varus, right? What are the three components of cubitus varus? Sagittal plane, coronal plane, and what are they? Coronal plane is varus. Varus. Uh, sagittal plane is going to be 50 chance. Extension. Extension, right? And then how about, how about axial plane? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Good. I don't know. What do you think? Internal rotation. Internal rotation. Usually they put their arm at their side, so they get so they get internal rotation, extension, and varus, right? So we're gonna talk about that later. All right, so that's why we pet it. All right, so know why you do things, right? So um, all right, so here we go. Six-year-old foosh fell off the monkey bars, one of the most common mechanisms. 
This is an actual copied note from Stanford Epic. So um, Andrew, tell me, uh, just read the right upper extremity is broken. Uh, read that note and just tell me, a good note, bad note, are you happy? If you're the chief resident, would you call this resident and yell at them? Would you give them a pat on the back, say nice job? Reasonable. Um, yeah, what is it not? Like, so it's not NBI. So I put this note up there because that's what I don't want you to put, right? We want very detailed notes. We want to know exactly what three nerds are we going to test? Radio honor media. How are we going to test them? I'm a six year old kid. What are you going to tell me to do? So, one of the most helpful things is a mutual mood or confidence. So, flexing the IP joint and extending the IP joint gets the media and honor. Yeah, I'm six. Tell me what to do. I'm six years old. Tell me what to do. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Now what? My radial nerve works. What, what next? Have something in their hand, trying to get the squeeze in their hand. Can't squeeze it or bend your thumb. Now my median nerve works. Okay, what else? Cross your fingers or shake. Cross your fingers. How long do you have to be to cross your fingers? Usually five. So this kid probably can do it. Three year olds not gonna be able to do it. So you gotta tell them to spread their hand apart or show me a high five or something, right? So you, quick test, three, three nerves. So this is pretty good. The only thing I don't like is this. So this is pretty unusual. Even kids that hurt, if you're calm and gentle with them and have a little patience, you can get them to move. So I hate when they say, oh, they won't move because of pain. Now I don't know if he's, does he have an ulnar nerve palsy or not? He's got intact sensation, which is a little iffy. I think sensation is kind of iffy in a kid with a horrible fracture. And then we don't have a pulse. So we got warm, well perfused, which I think is important. I'd like a little cap refill in less than two seconds. Um, and I really like they put an ultrasound on it. Okay. So they have, you know, what I call the wind blowing. So here's the extra, all right? So what type of fracture is this, Bryce? Uh, it looks like a type four with complete periosteal. Can you tell if it's type four yeah. fracture? All right, so. Yeah. It's type three, four. And, yeah, and I hate when you say that, right? So <laughs> until we know what it is, <laughs> it might help it. You know, she might have a distal femur fracture too. Like, don't tell me things that they might have. Like, what do you know they have? Uh, at least a type three. It is a type three, right? If you push really hard, it might be a type four. We'll talk about that later, right? So there's an extension or a flexion type? Uh, extension. Extension. So by convention, the distal part relative to the proximal part. So the distal part's behind the proximal humor, so this is an extension type. What percentage are extension types? 95. Yeah, almost all of them, 95, 97, something like that. Okay, and any other characteristics about this X-ray that are kind of worry you? Anything? Somebody's taking a close look. Sorry, you kind of sideways, but. I don't think so. Just a, just a garden variety, bad super combo, okay? So um, this is a different patient, but this kid had some of this on the left side. So what do we what do we call that, Joseph? When there's all this bruising in the breakout side, okay? And then look at this kid's hand. So before, you know, I, I was just in New Zealand and I got to examine all of the, they call them registrars but there's only 63 residents in all of New Zealand and I got to give them an exam on their physical exam skills. Look, feel, move, special tests. So they really do a lot of looking, inspecting. So when you inspect a kid, you can learn a lot before you even touch the kid. And I think that's good in peds because they're afraid and they got a bad, they just have a bad fracture. So tell me about this kid's left hand. What's, what's going on? What do you think? Uh, the left hand looks pink to me, at least on this side. It's pink, I think it's well perfused. It's got pink, well perfused, bruises. How about the position of the finger? Position of the fingers. The, uh, what's, what's this kid telling? Yeah, the, the small and ring finger are flexed. Yeah. That was potentially, you know, you. I didn't move it. I just kind of held it so that it wouldn't. I say, oh, hold yeah. on, I got to take a picture. Yeah, it's hard to, to discern without them moving it, but potentially, you know, I what is the of radial or uh, ulnar pulse? Ulnar nerve pulse. You think? What do you think? Unless you're asking them to give you a thumbs up, yeah. I'm more concerned about AI and palsy here. AI and palsy, right? So if you have less resting tension in your index finger, they kind of give you this pointer sign. But what's the most common nerve injured in superconnellers and kids? Yeah. Yeah. Why is that? Um, the position of, of, the, of the median nerve and the uh, AIN branch off the Yeah, they, the median nerve's in the front of the humerus, and, and it's going to get, as the fracture gets extended, the nerve's going to get draped over that proximal spike often, and then the AIN fibers are actually most posterior in the median nerve, right? And what's the sensory distribution? You know, someone's asked you that, I'm sure. Of the median nerve? Of the anterior interosseous nerve. Huh? There isn't one, right? Yeah, it's just purely motor nerve. So how are we going to tell the difference between an AIN palsy and a median nerve palsy? 
Sensation. Sensation. That's a good one. What else? Um, Sensation. We just talked about unreliable and little kids. Uh, Put their hand in water. Some people do that. And come back and see if their skin wrinkles. <laughs> kind of never done that. But. FDS rather than FDS, FDS, right? Good. Yeah. So you could do FDS. So if they can do this. And is it important to know if they have a median nerve palsy or an AIN? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Why? Uh, there's some literature that suggests if it's a, like a high median nerve, it's a higher rate of vascular injury. So associated vascular injury, definitely. And then some people will say that's an indication for overreaction. Like they want to go look at if they have a complete median nerve palsy. I don't do that. But I think it's, it is important because if you can't feel your forearm, maybe you get a silent compartment syndrome. That's the other thing. The median nerve gets sensation to the vulvar compartment that we're worried about for bulkness. But do this little test and you can differentiate, right? FDS. I think this is really important. If you don't have a pulse, you should have a Doppler in the ED and you should try to figure out is there a signal? Do you have any flow distally? That also helps you can kind of tell these fingers are um, have some color and perfusion. Um, I think that's important. All right. So, uh, Bryce, you're going to call the OR. We got a perfused pulses supraconylar in the ED. When do we want to do it? Perfused Yeah. We want to do it, I guess it depends. Midnight. It's midnight? Yeah. Uh, I think we want to do it within six hours. Within six hours. How about you? Uh, I'd probably post, I'd call my attending, but post, right. it, post it at 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Can you repeat the vascular exam? When do you want to do it? They're perfused and pulses. No pulse. Yeah. Looks like the nerves. We, we are like a little worried about the ulnar nerve. I went and saw the kid. The ulnar nerve works fine. We don't have any nerve deficits, but we have no pulse. Midnight. And we got brachial Midnight. Midnight. I would, I would still leave it at the discretion of the attending. I think different people will choose different things, but probably can be done first case in the morning rather than in the middle. First case in the morning. And the attendings in the audience, raise your hand. You're going to do first case in the morning. No one's, no one's picking that up. All right, so we're going to do some fundamentals. So, one fifty two in the morning, that's my time step on the. Um, so, what did you ask for when you called the OR? You said, Oh, I thought we were going to do the morning. I just talked to the attendee. He just yelled at me. He said, We're going right now. Can you give me a room? What do I need? Pain table, large CR, K wires. Good. Uh, this one, I'd probably. Uh, Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when the pulse is out, like have a hand tray, maybe you have some vascular instruments available just to ward off evil spirits. Don't open them, put them in the back of the room. Great. All right. So now we got to get reduced, right? So we're going to do a reduction maneuver. So uh, what are you going to do first, Bryce? Take some x-rays. No arm. Might take some x-rays. Yeah. Um, you got to remember this? You have a brachial sign. You, you said that's what it was, right? What are the three components of a brachial sign? Um, and a cubital bruising. I showed you that. The ecchymosis. The, uh, a lot of times you can palpate the palpable bony fragment right. subcutaneously and puckering, right? So those are the three things, right? So, Sam, what are you going to do if you have a brachial sign? I'm going to try to milk the. Milk it. Uh, Good. Uh, awesome. Looks like kind of like that. I don't really do it like that. I think there's a better picture in the article, it's more like this. It's more like put your hand around medial and lateral and pull the brachialis muscle off of the proximal spike. You can often kind of feel that spike all of a sudden disappear. You can't feel it anymore. Then you're ready to do your reduction maneuver, okay? And if you don't do this, you, you may fail. So who in, who on the panel has done, actually done it yourself, done a close reduction of a supercar? Oh, good. All right, one of them, we'll start the two then. <laughs> Tell me the steps. They're the same every time. What are the steps? And get Extension. Coronal reduction. Good. A little bit of traction, maybe first. Yeah. Get coronal reduction. I like that. And then after you get your coronal reduction, you're going to flex the elbow. Yeah. Okay, good. What else might you do? Where are you going to put your thumb? Push the electron forward. forward. Good. Yeah. So this is from Mercer Rang's textbook. Um, who's read Mercer Rang's Children's Fractures? Any of you guys? Do you read books anymore? Just all online, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, I think this is really important. So, you got it right. So, you got right. A little bit of traction, correct medial lateral translation, correct ferrous valgus, correct that internal rotation. So, he's showing you a little bit of external rotation usually. Then, you want to push the electron forward as you flex the elbow. And uh, orthopedic surgeons are strong, kids are little. Don't push too hard. 
you know, kind of go a little bit at a time. It's not rapid, right? So, so now we're going to get it reduced, right? So here's the hundred. This is the million dollar question, which is never described in the orthopedic literature, which makes it for superficial humerus fractures makes it hard. So what's it, what's an acceptable reduction? Do you have any criteria? You've all done it, so you. The anterior line intersection. Anterior line should hit the gap down. I like that one. What was angle? Bowman's angle. What's Bowman's angle? Uh, it's the, the axis between the, the line drawn through the axis of the humeral shaft and then the cartilage of the uh, captellum. Yeah, of the lateral condylar plexus. Yeah, some good. people would say it's 60 to 80, but a lot of people use the contralateral extremity and say 5 good. to 10. And why are you trying to measure it? Uh, sometimes there's some subtle medial combination you're not appreciating. Yeah. And you you're trying to avoid, avoid the commandment in orthopedics. Right? So thou, thou shalt not bears, right? Exactly. So, like for me, if you do those two things, you're good, right? No bears. And the anterior humeral line even touches the capitellum. I'm mostly going to say that it's okay. And I, I say on the slides, but I've taken a lot of rotation. Um, so, let me ask you this. Um, why do, if you fall on an outstretched hand and you're six years old, why do you get a superficial humerus fracture and you have the same mechanism and you're 12 years old and you break your form? Kids are a little flexible and sometimes they hyperextend. And hyperextension, right? So if you look at every kid that has a supercondylar, you look at their other side, they hyperextend. Okay? Once they get, they don't get that. When they land, they get an axial load and it goes to their form. When they hyperextend, what happens? The bottle cap mechanism. Yeah, so the electron is basically a driven electron on fossa. Supercondylar fossa is this thin wafer of bone, right? And it's like knife edges, right? So when you're trying to do a reduction, so the thing that if you get it perfect, great, you're going to be more stable. You're going to be less likely to tilt the varus or valgus. But that's where we're going to get into the importance of your pen construct and doing your pens the right way, right? So these two things, and I've seen so many people struggle to get it perfect. You do not have to get it perfect, okay? You, if you don't have any varus and your anterior humeral line touches the captellum, that kid's going to do fine, okay? Translation's okay. All right. So now we're going to, we got it reduced. So we're going to, that's something. We're going to do. So you get it reduced. Now you got to pin it. You asked for some K wires. What size? Um, kid is like less than eight or nine. It'd probably be one six. One six, right? So the workhorse is one six because almost all they're most common five to eight year olds. So in that age range, it's going to be a one six or a 0.062 inch K wire. Why not smaller? Not strong enough. Not strong enough. It'll bend. So I've seen a lot of four or five K wires bend. Okay. When are you going to switch? Probably like eight or nine year old. No science to this. <coughs> Mine is older than eight, more than 20 kilograms. So you got a giant six-year-old. There's some giant six-year-olds in North Carolina. Not as many giant six-year-olds in California. But if they're giant, yeah, use a two mil. And, and I, if they're 11, I might put a two-four wire, right? So, okay. And how are you going to start? Where do you start your pen, Bryce? Uh, on the lateral side of the elbow. Lateral, lateral side. Why do we Why do we favor lateral entry pen? Uh, to avoid hitting the uh, ulnar nerve. So the, and. It's quoted, maybe it's 2%. I don't know if it's that high. Depends on how many you put in and how you put them in. But to avoid all iatrogenic ulnar nerve injury, typically now we use lateral entry penning from David Skagg's work. This is a long time ago. So, and you put two pens in. So, Joseph, where do you want your pens to be? What's, and, and your medial column, the pens would be on the, you know, exiting the medial column on the medial third of the humerus. And then you're crossing the fracture, the medial third of the humerus. Yeah. You want your lateral column pinned across the fracture in the lateral third. Excellent. Do you, know, you know of any grading system that's been published? Scannell et al. JBJS 2013. <laughs> there is one. <laughs> <laughs> so I like that though. So we that's also not in the literature. So then we talk about malunion rates, like what was acceptable? How did you pin it? Did you get a good reduction? So we graded reductions, we graded pen constructs. So for me, I think it's really, you can just draw the, the distal numbers into thirds. And I want one pin to cross the fracture in the medial third, one pin to cross in the lateral third like this. And then I'll test it. And if I want another one, I'll, I'll put one in the center, right? So we gave, if you had one in the medial, one in the lateral, that was an A. If you had one in the middle and one in the lateral, that was a B. You know, so if you had uh, not as much pin spread, so there's a lot of pin spread biomechanical there, more pin spread of the fracture, more stable, right? And then we grade reductions too. So uh, think about that. And so what I do, I always start with the most medial pen. I, I basically give the resident a target. I say, like, you know, fill the capitellum. I want you to start 
as medial as you can without hitting the electron, and I want you to aim for five millimeters above the fracture so that you grab bone over here. It's a feel operation. You don't do it by fluoro, you do it by feel. Okay, so you gotta learn what it feels like when the K-wire is in bone and when it's not in bone and what it feels like to grab a cortex. Once you feel it, you know when when pinning first came out in the old days they were doing this. I named Joseph Flynn described blind pinning. It was a feel operation. They didn't have fluoro. You do it by feel, think it's good, get a flat plate. See if your pens look okay. Yeah, if you did good, if you felt it right. Um, ben Jackson, anybody heard Ben Jackson's name here? He'll get his name on the alumni. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Ben, when I was here, had a record. He, he put 21 pens in a row without redirecting or missing. So we used to have a little contest among the residents and keep a track of like, how many pens can you put in without having to redirect? Because if you pay attention to landmarks and you feel anatomy and do it by feel, you can do it right. You know? So all right, that's how we pen it. This is how not to pen it. I just saw this recently. This is from Jay Posna. Who reads Jay Posna? Anybody? Residents, Journal of Pediatric Peak Society of North America. It's free, online, searchable, lots of good content, right? <laughs> so, so this is a, 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 a tumor guy. Not to make fun of tumor guys. There's two of them in the room that have taught me. I've taught me a lot over the years, but so uh, he, he, it's just a single column fixation, right? And pens are all crossing at the fracture, right? So that's a no-no, right? Perfect reduction, right? Looks amazing, but fell apart, right? So pen concert matters, and uh, how you take care of your pens matters, right? So here's my pens from that case. So how do I do? I'll let you. What do you think, Andrew? Kind of hard. Yeah. Hard to see. I know it's, you guys are sideways. I know. Uh, it looks. It looks pretty good. Look, reduction's not bad. I got a little step off. Vehicle. You can't really see Bauman's angle. I think it's going to be okay. But I've got one medial in the medial third. I got one in the lateral third, one second. Okay, I think that's. So if I see that, uh, I'm happy. Here's I always take some oblique views. Here's my lateral view. The anterior humeral line is going to hit the capitellum. So I don't have Barris. I don't. I don't have any extension. I'm going to accept this reduction, even though it's not perfect. Okay. So how do you take care of your pins? Sam, what do you do? You bury them, not bury them. What do you do? Never bury them. Yeah. Um, you put something between the skin and the pin to prevent the pin from moving, wiggling around. Yeah, the whole deal is to prevent skin pin motion, right? What do you think the most common complication? If we, if we were to ask an in training question today on the most common complication of supercolonic humerus fractures now, what do you think it is? Probably pin site. But even that, if you do it right, it's pretty darn low. We did a series. We looked across all the more sites, about a thousand of them. It was 0.08% or something, like really low. But this is how I do it. So I learned this in San Diego, sterile felt. But all you're trying to do is manage the pen skin interface. Um, and if you do it right, I think you can have a really low incidence of skin tract infection. Do you antibodies prevent it? Do you need antibodies? So we don't know if you need an or not because we can't do a study that's adequately powered because it is so low. Um, who gives antibiotics in the attending world? I still give antibiotics. I get one shot. I think it's low, but I don't think you have to. So Chris Yopes, who I practice with in Orlando, he's a limb lengthener and basically says any pen that's in for three weeks isn't going to get infected. So, so a lot of pen site infections are how long is the pen in, right? And these are going to be in not very long, right? All right. What else do we have to do? Oh, don't the wrong way. So how are you going to tell that your pins are, that your fractures fixed well, right? What's your stability test at the end of penny? Anybody got one? Internal rotation stress test. So internal rotation stress test, right? I like that one. So go all the way from external to internal. And um, this just shows you here, I've pinned one. Anyway, I go all the way from external to internal, you get a true lateral internally. And then I do flexion extension um, with the arm extra. If, it, if the two fragments don't move, I'm done. If they do move, I put another pen in, right? So we looked at that in a cadaver model with Chris and uh, one of, uh, I called it the IOBST test because that's how he spelled his name. So it's <laughs> clever. Uh, but if you need another pen, so say it was unstable. Here's a bad fracture, that a little atypical fracture pattern. So when do you need a medial pen, Sam? Um, you need a medial pen if you're not adequately, adequately capturing the medial column. 
Yeah. Or if you fail. So if, you, if you didn't get a medial third pin, if you want more stability, because you're going to get more stability. Sometimes a fracture pattern, right? So if you have a really oblique fracture pattern that starts, you know, really high on the medial side and goes down low on the lateral side, it's kind of in the same angle as your lateral entry pin, then you're going to need a cross pin to get it, right? And this one just has a, a weird. So how do you safely put in a medial pin? So what you're trying to avoid is damage to the ulnar nerve. So there's a number of things you can do. You could make a small open approach and see bone and not. Yeah, hard to do. You can extend. Incision. You can make a little incision. You kind of feel it. You can extend the arm and try to. The number one thing, I think. So get some fixation in there. If you can get one or two lateral entry pins in first and then extend the elbow. We got a super flex. What percentage of children in this age range are going to have an ulnar nerve that subluxes anteriorly? I don't know, but I guess it's high. It's a Boston Children's study. Yeah. No, it's high. Like five to ten percent. I can't remember the exact number. Peter might remember, but it's high, right? And you can, if you're really good, you check that on the non-injured side when you're looking at their alignment, and then you can flex your elbow and see, oh wow, that's one of the medial. Uh, that's dangerous. So that hyperflex. So get them out of um, that hyperflex position. And then you can put in safely put in a medial pin. And so far, I've been lucky that I don't, don't have an iatrogenic ulnar nerve palsy that I know about. All right, what's the role of the Doppler? So we pinned it, we've got a stable fracture pattern, we've tested it, we know how we're gonna fix our pins, but what are we most worried about? Like, if you get a malunion, I can fix that, right? If you get a Boltman's ischemic contracture, not fixable, right? So we're going to check the blood flow to the extremity after we do the pinning, and now we've straightened out the arm and taken the pressure off the anterior antecubital fossa. So how are we going to test it? Clinically, number one, feel it, right? I do not trust my fingers or residents' fingers, especially if I've been like worried and tense in the OR. So I always do this. So the other thing you didn't ask for when you posted the case is tell them, I want a Doppler, right? I need a Doppler in the room. We're going to check the Doppler before and after, during maybe. So do this, and this is out of the same 2013 Scannell's article is in front of this one, that this is out of Dallas, a giant series, but they kind of tried to define for us what's the role of a Doppler assessment in the OR after you've done a penny. Because the CNC paper basically said, you can watch it. You know, you can, you can, even if it doesn't have a Dopplerable pulse, there was one case in that series that got watched and they all did okay. Okay, we're gonna talk about how to watch them in a minute. This one said, if you don't have a good Doppler signal, you should explore. And I would say that's where I've moved to in my practice. So if I have a good pulsatile signal at the wrist after I've done a pinning and the hand is still well perfused, I will watch it, okay? And if I'm really worried about it, um, you know, there's somebody at the head of the table, no matter where you are, who's an expert in perfusion. Their job is to keep the child's brain perfused and the rest of their body perfused while you're fixing their elbow. They're called an anesthesiologist. Ask them to walk around and say, hey, do you think this hand looks like the other one? Get, get an unbiased opinion because you're pretty invested in this. So if you're really worried, ask somebody who isn't so invested. And if they say, yeah, it doesn't look so good to me, maybe you should explore it. Look harder, okay? So that, I use this a lot, and I think that uh, it's a good one. All right. Who's John Charlie? This is from his book, Taking Hands. Who's John Charlie? Charlie, uh, even Charlie Retractor. Brother John, yes. <laughs> yes. Who's John Charlie? The one the hip prosthesis, John Charlie? That guy. That guy, the father of total hip arthroplasty, right? So low friction arthroplasty, called it. Let's see who's a, who are our arthroplasty attendings out there. They're all cringing. They're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so uh, Sir John Charlie, knighted for his work in orthopedics, changed the world. Like, so what are the three most effective operations in the world for quality of life years improvement? Total hips in the top three, total knees in the top three, bypass. Somebody just told me total shoulders in the top up there. So Natty, good on you, man. Good on you, mate. <laughs> Brian, you guys are helping a lot of people. So John Charlie. So if you have not read this book, I will send you guys, I will email you a couple things. One, I have a PDF of this book because it's not in print anymore. You should read it. Um, and uh, I also have my 20 tips that I'm happy to send. So how do you split the elbow? What position are you going to put the elbow in? How are you going to decide? You don't want to be much not beyond 90. Why? Because um, it just cre creates more pressure. So Dr. Scannell told you not to do that? Or Dr. Clark said, hey, that's bad. We're not going to do that. Why is it bad? Because it can still 
cause malperfusion. There's an artery, right? So I got Bill Henriquez. He just did a simple study. I love these simple studies. Took a Doppler, bent elbows, documented at what degree of flexion did the pulse go away by at the, at the wrist, the Doppler signal. More than 90 goes away. We don't want to do that, right? So how much flexion should you put them in? So every kid's different, right? So what I do is I bend the elbow until I see it start to crease like my jacket. And then I straighten it out until I don't see a crease and that's where I put them. So sometimes it's 60, sometimes it's 70, sometimes it might be close to 90, but never more than 90, okay? Just like this, right? So Charlie, this is from his book. Like, it's like bending a balloon, right? And if the artery is in here, you're in trouble, right? Just like that first case I showed you, so, right? And then do you use a splint, use a cast? Cast, 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 cast. How do you put the cast on? What technique do you use? Fiberglass or plastic? Fiberglass. Stretch relaxation. Stretch relax, right? Yeah. So I wrote that paper when I was a fourth year resident here, you know, and did a little experiment with little cast pressure things. But I learned it from John Davies. But it's it has an inherent elasticity. The very first volume of the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma said you should never put fiberglass on an acute cast, on an acute fracture. It's dangerous. It's too tight. Cause compartment sore. Very first edition of JOT Volume One, Edition One. So it was thought to be dangerous when I was a resident. No one used fiberglass. Then I went to the shrine. Every, they were all getting fiberglass. They seem to be doing fine. So when you're a resident, you see something like that. Like think about it, and maybe you can do a little study. So stretch your lack. So you can't put it on too tight. And then what do you do at the end? Yeah, you either buy velvet or unit velvet, and uh, you've tested the stability. And but this is what I do. And I I usually, if I'm not very worried. But if the pulse is intact and there's no neurologic deficits, I just cut it on one side, but I think the cast has more inherent stability. And I always cut it on the medial side because when the kid comes in the office and you try to take the cast off, they're going to go like this. And so they'll show you the outside. They won't show you this side, right? <laughs> so I cut it on the inside. I spread it. I have these little spacers. And we showed in that study that if you did this, that the pressure in the cast went down to the pre-swelling and induced swelling levels, right? But if you're worried, you got a nerve deficit, you got an artery out, five out. That way, in the middle of the night, you don't have to get a cast off. Kid has a problem. You can take the front of the cast off, feel their forearm, check their pulse. Good. And you don't get the first web space included? Uh, maybe for me. So, all right. We're going to go back to Scanel et al. 2013. Um, so, we got a perfused pulse of supercondylar. We fixed it. We think we have a, maybe we have a comparable pulse. We definitely have a good Doppler signal at the wrist. We're going to just watch this child. So, what does that mean? What are, you, what are you going to do? What are you going to write in the orders? What are you going to tell the nurses? What are you going to tell your fellow resident on call that night? Go ahead. Make sure you give some a detailed nerve aspect examining color of the hand. What yep. The so they need to know what, where you started, right? Yeah, what the pulse is. What the That's pulse why that note's really important, right? So people forget, like, one of the reasons we write things in the chart is we're actually trying to communicate to other people on the healthcare team that we may not be able to talk to. They should be able to look up in the chart and see, like, oh, at the end of this case, Get had pulse, had a Doppler signal, had brisk capillary refill. So you put all those things in the chart. Okay. Tim? Pulse socks. Pulse socks. So you can see I'm helping you out a little bit. Pulse socks on the finger. I like that. I'm not sure what the right number is. I don't think anybody really knows. I just kind of say 92 and above. Okay. I just don't want to keep hanging. Whatever it started with, let's keep it there. Right. I learned that from Dr. Ward. What else? Check on the kid, see how he's doing or she. Uh, so what do you have in the bedside for the nurses? Doppler, so order a Doppler to the bedside. That's part of the careful. See that sharpie dot? So when you're in the OR, put a dot on the radio artery where you can hear it so they can find it. You know? Then what else? Here's my list. This is what we call calf. So they got to stay perfused. Whatever they've got when they leave the OR, it can't get worse, right? Color, capillary refill, O2 sats. If they have Doppler signals, you keep it. If they can move all their fingers, they should be able to keep moving all their fingers. So whatever active motion they have before you operate on them, they better have <coughs> all through the night and the next day, right? They shouldn't have increasing pain, and they shouldn't have increasing AIDS, right? What are the AIDS? So, inc so they call you from the floor, and they say, this kid is bouncing off the walls. Can I give him some Advil? What's your response? I'm the nurse. Let me come and take a look yeah, at that's exactly right, right? Yeah, thank you. I'll be right there to check on it. Right? So increasing A's, right? So more analgesia. I need more morphine. This kid's screaming. He's agitated. Can I give him out of band? No. You know, and the, the last one, 
anxiety, so it's kind of the same, right? So the A's are more predictive of compartment syndrome in children than the P's. So that's the lesson, right? All right, so here we are. Uh, they came back to clinic. They were stable. I didn't see them in a week. I'm really worried. I'm, I probably saw this kid in a week just for a pulse check, make sure that they're doing okay. Um, what other instructions would you give the kid when they get discharged from the hospital? Elevated. Pulse check, elevated, gonna wear a sling. What's the most important thing? If you have a problem, if you have, if you have pain, if you can't sleep at night, if you notice his fingers change color, if all of a sudden you can't make a fist and open it, where do you want them to come? What hospital? Your hospital. The number one thing to tell them is if you have a problem, come back to our hospital because we know how to take care of this. Don't go somewhere else. I don't care how close it is to your house. Do not go there. They will get confused. Bad things will happen. So the one, the one Boltman's ischemic contracture just in that Dow study is a, a pulses is, is a kid who had pain, went to a local ER, got discharged, showed up in Dallas three weeks later with a claw hand. Okay, so come to our hospital. So the number one thing you tell the parents, if you have a problem, come back to this place. Okay, so they didn't have a problem. They're in your clinic now three weeks out. That actually looks like this. What are we going to do? Consider pulling your pins. It's your clinic. What are you considering? Yes or no? Yeah, he's got good pronouncing. Yes or no? Pins out? Yeah. Yes or no? Pins out. Pins out, right? I've never not, I mean, not on wood, never seen a super collar not healed at three weeks. Some people leave them for four weeks. I think that's fine. More than four weeks, you run the risk of increasing your pin site infection risk, right? So what, what does the x-ray show you? Yeah, if you see that little white stripe of periacetal new bone, you can just take the pins out. So, um, and never say never, never say always, but I do look at the x-ray, but there's a lot of, now literature says maybe we don't need this x-ray. They all heal so reliably. Maybe this just doesn't change treatment. You should just take the pens out. I don't know about that. I'm not, I'm not there yet. So we got a healed fracture. We're lined up pretty well. We have a little bit of extension. Maybe that's probably an internal rotation view. And then, um, so we, we take the pens out, all right? Do you give them analgesia for that? No. Distraction works. So we do a prospective randomized trial of distraction. So something, give them a movie. We give them virtual reality goggles, have them play a game. So they have less pain, but it's really, if you know what you're doing, it's simple, it's straightforward, don't need analgesia. Then what do you tell them? I took the pins out. Are you finished? See you later, have a nice life. Are you coming back to see me? What are you gonna do? Probably see him back. Again. You're see him back one time? Yeah. When? Probably three more weeks. Three more weeks. Three weeks going once. Three weeks? Three weeks. Three weeks? A month. A month? Is this still the pulse test? Yeah. yeah, pulse is in, but we just took the pins out. And the pulse is back. So now we're, and we don't have a nerve depth, so we got a good pulse. Pens are out. You have a good pulse at that visit? I don't need to see them. Don't need to see them back, right? So I tend to see them back one time. You probably don't have to. You could have to instruct the mom. And I see them at six weeks, okay? And I'm a, it's what we call a carrying angle and a range of motion check. And so I usually do it by telehealth. It takes literally two minutes. Hold your arms out, bend them, straighten them out. Give me the signs and see them, you know? So why six weeks? Prospective randomized trial. If I didn't send her to PT, why didn't I send her to PT? PT, not need. Level one evidence. Don't need PT after supercalling. Good. But when do they get their motion back? Six weeks. About 80 to 85% of your motion back, six weeks. Why is it important if you're going to do a carrying angle check, check to have good motion? Why? Well, extension, right? And the elbow's a minor hinge, right? So if I can't extend my elbow all the way, it might look straight, but I'm really embarrassed. And those last 20 degrees are when the bear shows up, right? So wait until they have full extension, and that's why we do it in six weeks, okay? So then I, then I usually discharge them, except occasionally. So I got an x-ray in six months. Sam, why you were going to probably on this one. Why did I get an x-ray in six months in this perfuse pulse to superconal humor Well, if you're worried about bears or about osteonecrosis. Osteonecrosis is what? Um, I think it's been described more trochlea, but it could be, I yeah. suppose, any part of it. Mostly the trochlea. Yeah, could be anywhere. But it is for perfused pulses supercondylars, and uh, this is uh, out of uh, Boston Children's, Dr. Waters' group. Um, you can get this. And we found three of them in the in the series that I've mentioned before that Dr. Skinnell wrote up. Terrible problem. Don't really have a good answer for it. 
Um, but you kind of want to know if you're having it. And sometimes the kids are relatively, the parents haven't paid much attention to it. So we have three out of 20. And I've definitely seen a handful more since this article was published. So I usually tell them either, hey, if you notice any problem, your kid's got full range of motion now. And I show the parents. If they stop doing that, come back to see me. Or I just have them come back in six weeks, six months and take a picture. So we're looking for AB in the show. All right. Here's a good case. So, um, Andrew, do you, does a child need a brachial artery? Uh, to perfuse, not necessarily. You've got the gradient How do you know that? Is there any literature that would support that assertion? I don't know if there's a CNN in the OR, but <laughs> you're a Dr. Snell study. You had like four or five people in that study with an occluded brachial artery. Yeah, exactly. So, five of the 20 were occluded and they were doing fine. So, you can't have collaterals. And then there's also literature from kids with renal disease and they tie off the brachial artery for access and their arm seems to grow normally. Now, again, remember, you can get fooled because those kids didn't have trauma and they had, they should have them to like pristine, non-traumatized collaterals. Not always the case with us, right? But this kid, this is from my, I think I was maybe a fourth year resident. I learned a lot from this case too. But this is this kid's brachial artery right there. It ends right there. It's a completely normal pulse, bounding pulse in the ED but has this terrible open fracture. So what are we gonna do with this then? Post it at seven in the morning? No, just say <laughs> Oh no, okay. Some super calendars are gonna go at night. Yes, yes. This one's gonna go at night, right? I'm still watch it out of the ED. <laughs> yeah, you can watch it out, put a split on it. I probably, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't even try to stick that bone out. This kid's pretty funny. I was like, Johnny, why did you jump out of the treehouse? He goes, well, Jimmy jumped out. I'm like, well, Jimmy is your brother, he's 16, you're four. You know, so anyway, so this kid, totally stoic, everything works, great pulse, open fracture, ruptured brachial artery, not much literature to go through on this, but if you have an open injury and a brachial artery disrupted, probably going to try to fix that, right? Okay, what do you think, so this is probably, so this is 1990s, what do you think the patency rate was for vascular repair in superfound humerus fractures around the 1990s? Very low. 50-50, right? And why do you think that was how do you think they fixed it and who fixed it? Whoever was doing the case fixed it, I guess. Yeah, who's on call for vascular trauma most of the time? A pediatric guy? A hand guy? Or gal? No. Some vascular surgeon with loops on. So on a vessel that's like half the diameter they used to sewing. So no wonder that it you know didn't have great patency rates. So think about that. If you're gonna go somewhere and you're the one who's gonna take care of this problem, who am I gonna call? I need some help, right? So I was a fourth year resident. I knew the vascular attending on call. I wasn't a big fan. And uh, so who do you think I called? I called the hand team. Who do you think answered the phone? El Ward, right? So we're golden. I'm like, thank God Forney was not on call. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Dr. Hutchinson was here and he would get really mad if you called him for a vascular problem. He was not a vascular call. So, so anyway, I was like, sweet, well, let's fix it. So we take you to the OR. You know, and we pin it, and you see a little bulldog on the brachial artery. You bend the elbow, you resect the abnormal, you know, vessel, flex the elbow to get a little leg, fix the brachial artery. But think about that. So in your system, I always tell people, if you're the one taking call for supercolic humerus fractures and you have a vascular problem, if it was your kid, who do you want fixing? And if it's your hand team, like, talk about that before it's two in the morning. Like, say, hey, I'm here, I'm in town. You know, if I have this problem, most of these perfused pulses ones are going to do fine. But if I have one where I think I need to explore the artery and I find out it's, disrupt it's disruptive, are you okay with fixing it? And the vast majority of hand surgeons are like, yes. They think it's a giant artery. You know, we're used to doing like digital arteries, right? So, so anyway, this kid um, ended up doing well. And I think he became a college swimmer. But this also taught me, right? So we extended his incision. Do you remember what his wound looked like that I showed you? Like an oblique, semi-transverse. I can't even see it, right? It was kind of right in here somewhere. So you can tell a little bit right there. There it is right there. So when you make your incision, don't make it transverse, right? You know, I mean, don't make it longitudinal. Make it transverse and then extend it if you need to. It'll be much more cosmetic. So all right, how much time do we have, by the way? 7.35 now. 7.45. 7.45. Okay, good. All right. So another quick one. So closed, perfused pulses, similar. So you get this call occasionally. So somebody in the middle of the night in California trying to do the right thing, says kids perfuse pulses, 
I, I need to go right now. Does a close reduction, looks at the hand, it's white. Can't feel the pulse. Calls me in the middle of the night. What do I do? What did you tell me? Take the pins out. Take the pins out. Yes, go back to where you started. Go back to no pulse for fuse, right? Splint it in what position? Extension. So usually that's on like 30 degrees of flexion, right? Again, same thing. Don't bend the elbow very much. And do not assume that when you're talking, even if it's an orthopedic surgeon, and that they know what they're doing. You tell them what to do. So just like I should have learned in that first case, they call me from the mountains, like don't reduce it. Don't put it in a flex position. Like that kid came to us hyper flexed in an ambulance for like four hours, you know? So tell them exactly where you want, what position, where you want. I want to post your slab, 30 degrees flexion, wrap it loosely, you know, tell them. So he didn't listen. He, he didn't take the pens out. He didn't extend it. Um, so they show up. They got a complete meaning nerve palsy. They only have a like, I call it blowing wind monophasic Doppler. Now what am I going to do? What, what do you think, Joseph? How, many, how far out are these people when you brought the paper? He called me at midnight. It's probably, now they got that. It's probably four in the morning now. Yeah, I would take it back to the OR right away. Pull the pins. Yep, we're going to the OR. Yes, then what? Because of the media nerve palsy and the fact that this whole fiasco has already happened, I'd probably discuss just going and exploring it. Exactly. I like that plan. Right. So all the same things. Got to ask for all the equipment. We're here on the OR. Uh, you know, four thirty in the morning. Um, we're going to make sure we have a good table. We put our arms on. We're not going to do it on a C arm or something. And uh, we're going to do this. So this is that transverse incision, right? And uh, I like to say that open reduction of a supraglottic humerus fracture is basically like an open close reduction. So it's not like trauma surgery where also now I've got everything exposed and I can put all these little pieces back together and lots of clamps. And basically you make this little incision, you can put your finger or your thumb in there and then you can push the proximal fragment down while you're bringing the distal fragment up. And you can kind of feel the condyles and tell if you have rotation or not. But it's not the kind of thing where you'll put a bunch of retractors in and oh yeah, we got a perfect reduction. Still not gonna, it's, it's an open close reduction, right? All you're doing is removing the obstacles to reduction, especially what, what things, these things, right? So remember tendon, artery, nerve, so go find the nerve, find the artery, and get them out of the way. Make sure they're not in the fracture. And then you can do your, um, and then it's a close reduction of penning just like before. And this, um, they won't play, but this shows I got a sterile Doppler now because it went out. And I just go across this and actually lose signal right in the middle, like really dampens down, but then I have great signal, triphasic signal just on the other side of it. So I didn't do anything with it. It's intact, watched it. And uh, here's my penning construct. Let me think, A, B, C, we go for the A, right? So I, I got one medial, I got one in the middle, I got one lateral, anterohumeral line, touches the cap tail, not perfect, probably a little bit extended, uh, but touches it. And here we are, not in, vow, not in varus, normal pulses, normal function, two years later, right? So, and you can see that scar, pretty cosmetic, okay? All right, this will be the last one. What's this? Types. Flexion type. So the distal fragment is in front of the proximal fragment. <clears throat> what nerve is most likely injured? Ulnar nerve. Why? Because that's what's put, like that's where the periosteum is for, and that's where the tension is going to be on the nerve. Tension, right? Yeah. So it's stretched. So nerve praxis is almost always a stretch injury. So on the concavity, things are going to be okay. On the convexity, things are going to be stretched and, and great. So what's different about flexion types? Way more rare, they're way more unstable. Three percent more, more unstable. Likely to be open. More likely to be open. Good. How are we going to open it if we need to open it? So over the spike. Over the spike. Okay. Are... The one we're going to make sure that we set it up so we don't have to rotate the arm. We can rotate the C arm. So because you're going to do a lot of your reduction in a lateral view for this. But here's the spike. So this kid had this. I've seen this only a few times. But basically, it's kind of like a brachial stuff. It has this ecchymosis right over the medial elbow. I can feel proximal humerus kind of butthole through almost through the medial intermuscular septum. So should I do a close reduction? Should I milk it? Just like I would milk it on the front side. What do you think? So when you milk on the front side, what are you really milking off the proximal fragment? The brachialis muscle. If I were to milk this, what am I milking? So if so the, the, the question that I asked you, like which side to go, like so if you're gonna do 
because you're worried, remember it's an open reduction, but it's only to remove the obstacles and the things that are at risk. So in this side, because you're worried about the ulnar nerve, go medial, make a medial incision, and then you get the ulnar nerve out of the way. So here's my, uh, here's what's draped over that spike that I can feel. I don't know if you guys can see that. It doesn't quite project very well, but you can see that. So if I feel the bone medially, I don't even try to do a close up. I'm just too worried about the nerve. So I go look at the nerve, make sure it's freed off, freed off, and then I try to gently tease it off the proximal fragment. Mean, it was literally stuck on there, impaled in there. I think I would have, I might have even divided this nerve if I vigorously tried to do a close reduction. I surely probably would have just tucked it back into the fracture, which can happen. So got the nerve out of the way. I think it's helpful, set your C-arm up so that you can get a lateral view. And I do most of my reduction on a lateral view for the flexion time, as opposed to standard extension type. I use the AP view first, and then I swing to a lateral. This one, I do the lateral view first, because that's the plane that's most difficult to get reduced. And then I look at the AP, and then I pin it. And this one, you can do a medial pin pretty safely, because you're, you're just looking at it, right? Uh, let's see what to do. Slide sorter. So be wary of that medial ecchymosis sign. And uh, I've been trying to write that up for a couple of years. And they seem to keep rejecting it, but I think it's an important distinction. And so get the nerve, you know, proximal distal. And then when you make sure the nerve's happy behind your medial epicondyle pin and not under any tension. So last two minutes. So a little bit older kid, what kind of, what do you think, uh, Bryce, what kind of fracture is this? One, two, three, four, three, three. So complete translated, anytime you see this translation, you know all the cortices are broken. There's no continuity between the distal and proximal. This always worries me. So anytime I take an x-ray and this piece is just sitting here, right underneath the proximal fragment, especially if it's angulated one way or the other, it's kind of just telling you that this might be uh, trouble with some more views, but then we do our standard traction, correct medial lateral, and then we're going to flex it. But oh, what type is this? This is a four, right? So once you do this maneuver and you see that it goes from an extension type to a flexion type, or flex, you know you have a completely unstable fracture. And, uh, and this is the only way you can tell. So you can't tell in the ER. So don't just stop writing residents across the country, you're writing three versus four. We get that. It's three, so you do this, and then, oh, it's four. Then save that picture so you know it's a four, but then you got to treat like a flexion type and, and reduce the, the lateral plane, I think, is, is helpful to do first and then put your pins in and get a stable pitch. So, all right, I'll quit with that one. All right, any questions? You guys did a good job. Steve, one, one comment and then one question. Um, it's been a long time since I've done a super counter humerus fracture, but I'm ready, man. Put me in, coach. Um, the, the question for you, the, the question is, um, if you think back to med school and you think about a lot of the things where we use program learning, whether it's learning how to read EKGs with Tubin or Sidman Sidman for neuroanatomy or, um, or, or those sorts of programs, Felsen for chest x-rays, it seems like this would be very amenable to that because you got your 20 steps. Yeah. If you just change the format a little bit, you can get it online and everybody could probably benefit from it. Yeah, I think no that? question that this is one of the best topics for both simulation, yeah. like learning how to put pins in, learning about pen constructs, learning about stability beforehand, but also decision making. Yeah. You can do a lot of these things. And uh, I think for those of you that go to IPOS, IPOS often has like a team session where they grade people on team decision making. And they, they've done femur, they've done signals go out. and But I think they should do also, SuperCon would be a good one because I think you can learn a lot that, for sure. Yeah, Christian. Steve, do you think there's any role for uh, taking care of the brachialis sign in the ER? Uh, the first thing that I do yeah. when the patient comes in and I see that, yeah. as soon as they're asleep, uh, I think <coughs> I need to just pull them yeah. on. Yeah, to take, you know, I think it depends on who's doing it and what your experience is. And I, I just worry that people doing it the wrong way, you know, might make it worse, you know. But if it were you in there, yeah. 
mean, I, I don't think it's harmful at all to do if you know what you're doing. But again, if, after you do the brachialis, like in that setting, you're not gonna be flexing up, you just split it, no tension on the brachial artery, admit them, get them to the, but I don't think that it's a, I've had one case, um, they got admitted to our place with a brachial sign and I wanted to go, for me, a brachial sign is a sign of soft tissue um, at risk. And so I don't wait on brachial signs, I know that's controversial. Some people have everything works, but if I see a brachial sign, I'm gonna do it that night. So for me, the ones that go at night are of course open ones, any vascular problems, brachial sign, and I go if they have a nerve deficit, because I also think that they may not have protective sensation, and it's just another sign of the severity of the injury to me. So if they have a nerve deficit, I, I want to do them that night if I can get there. If I had a brachial sign, call the OR. There's a liver transplant going on and a heart transplant, and I got no anesthesia team. And so we put them on the floor. And, and then it's interesting, the kid's arm got so swollen that the brachial sign went away on the outside, like the puckered skin and stuff, but the brachial underneath is still there. And that's one where probably, you know, I probably should have milked it before I put them in the spine. In your video, uh, when you were showing the internal rotation test, you had sterile gloves on, but no gown. Are you doing yes. that? So it depends also on the, um, for me, uh, if all type twos and type threes that don't have associated vascular or neurologic deficits, I'll just do, we call it semi-sterile, where we just use gloves. It also depends on if I'm doing it. Right, so I was doing that was in Orlando. I was there was no residents this week, right? So if I'm doing it with the residents, I often get everybody to gown and glove just so we can feel and learn and draw. And so, but I don't think you have to. I think semi-sterile technique works great. Other questions? Yeah, right. For the perfused pulseless, um, as far as observing them afterwards, if you have a return of a palpable pulse, are you? letting them go home shortly after versus obviously the ones that you're more worried about. Are you just watching them for another? Time? Yeah. I don't know that the, some people have said 24 hours, some people have said 36, some people have 48. So I'm, I'm usually in the 24 hour camp, but if I know the family and I talk to them and I think that they understand all the issues and they don't live, you know, six hours away, then I'll let them go. Home. If you have a return of a palpable pulse on a previously perfused pulse list, uh -huh those you'll let go pretty quick same kind of thing same. i think same kind of thing you know because the only voltman's is in the literature had a return of bolts and was sent home and then came back to an er and in that series from dallas we also had another kid who had a return of bolts who then nine hours later became ischemic and went back to the or like while they were watching the hospital so yeah but i think again good instructions assess the family how far away do they live you know and then if you have a problem, you're coming back to our hospital, right? Good. Yes. Great talk. Uh, I just had a question about that case you showed where the community orthopedic surgeon took it. And then yeah. what do you think the role of the general orthopedic surgeon, you know, doing that case? Should he, I guess, in my mind, you, you pin it and you lose pulses and then you don't explore the artery yourself. Yeah. You know, what's the liability? I think he did just perfect. I think he did just great. Yeah. You know, uh, I told him that, you know, we always say like, we're, we say yes. So if you call us, we're going to say yes. You know, we'll take the patient no matter what, but if, you know, he, he did a good job and, and he literally was almost in tears. He's like, I have a six-year-old daughter. If this six-year-old loses her arm, before, I'm going to feel horrible. You know, can you please help me? I mean, he was just distraught. And, uh, but I told him, I said, look, I think you did all the right things. Like the standard is reduce the fracture and, and pin it and then reassess. <coughs> we did that. It got worse. You escalated and we're gonna take care of the kid and she did great. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. It was awesome. All right. Thank you to our guinea pigs. Nice work, guys. Okay. Yeah.